morning. Can everyone hear me? Thank you to our wonderful Reiki practitioners for offering their services during meditation. Relax, get comfortable in your seat. Know that this is a place of safety and calm and kindness and love. Breathe deeply. Exhale slowly. Fill your lungs with fresh air. Center your core with your breathing. deeply. Allow calm into your being. Allow whatever thoughts come to mind to flow through you. Clear your mind.
with each breath, universal energy enters you, its manifestation. All is well. With each breath, feel the love of this beautiful place and these beautiful people surrounding you.
focus your breath.
No matter where you come from, no matter where you're going, here's a place where you can take comfort in the knowing that whether if you come to stay a while or just passing through this door is open to you. Come and let's be back. Come and share a hug. Come, let's pray together. Come love and be loved. From the blissed out to the turned out. From the pampered to the abused. This door is open to you. Come on in. Come on in. The God in us recognizes the God in you. Whether you're black or white, gay or straight, Christian, Buddhist, or Jew, this door is open to you. If there's some kind of trouble or pain you're going through, know that you are not alone. And someone cares for you as an individualization of divine point of view. This door, oh, this door, oh, this door right here is open for you. Oh, this door, I'm talking about this door. I said this door is open to you. Come on in. the God in you, whether you're black or white, gay or straight, Christian, Buddhist, or Jew, this door is open to you. All right, let's keep that going. Welcome. All right. Our spiritual leader, the Reverend Dr. Ken Wilcox. <laughs> Oh, uh, send greetings out to Eddie Watkins Jr. Gosh, miss that guy. Well, I'm Reverend uh, Ken Wilcox. Welcome to be here today. You know, all life asks, all it requires is opportunity to appear. You're that opportunity, and so am I. It's the purpose of this wonderful teaching of ours to keep us reminded of this essential truth in our lives and to help this truth show up in our lives in a greater, more dynamic, and powerful way. I always ask you to do one simple thing each Sunday morning. And that's to leave all your troubles, your fears, your would your could your should-haves, to leave all that stuff outside, and for the next 45 minutes or so, to open up an avenue of spirit possibilities in your life. And what are spirit possibilities? Well, there's more love, more joy, more happiness, more music, more food, more dance, more friends, more laughter. It's all those things in life that make us feel alive. Because that's what God is doing through you and through me, showing up in the physical, recognizing itself through our love, our joy, and our laughter. So know you're in a great place this morning. Spirit is going to recognize and reward you abundantly. Well, just a couple of announcements before we get going. As you came in, you probably noticed that we have a table full of laptops, uh, computers. And those computers were donated to us by the Judy James gang. That was our practitioner, Judy James, her children still support us. And they had collected laptops from their uh, family. We had them reconditioned. And these laptops are going to go to women who are leaving the Betty Griffith shelter. The Betty Griffith shelter, yes. Uh, it is a shelter for uh, families fleeing violence. And most of the time, the people there tell me that, you know, when you in that kind of circumstance, when you flee a family that's full of violence, it's not a planned situation. You've waited until something intolerable happens and you, you run out with the kids. So often the families show up at the Betty Griffith house without clothes, without toys, without really anything to restart their life. And in modern, modern life, computers are a necessity. So we've had these computers uh, uh, reconfigured, and we'll give them to uh, women leaving the Betty Griffiths uh, Center. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get them new computers? I know, I know there is some corporation in town, 
Uh, is it Target? Is it uh, Walmart? Is it uh, uh, Aldi's even? If we went to them and explained to them, we've got this fund, the Elizabeth Clare Fund, where we are helping women who are fleeing violence, I bet you they would do some kind of grant for us where we could buy new computers for these women. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Because these women probably hadn't gotten many new things in their life, and a new computer might be the burst of energy they need not to go back to their abusers, because a lot of them do. So that's just something to let that percolate. If that's something you want to take on as a mission of yours, let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to let you do it. And, <laughs> and it can make a big, huge difference in the world. Now, talking about a big, huge difference in the world, our dear friend Richard Austin has got a, a serious health challenge. He's had a second uh, surgery. He's up at Shands Hospital in Jacksonville. He will probably be up there for another week. We're, last week, we sent him um, cards. This week, we're making videos of prayers and affirmations for him. If you would like to send him a video prayer affirmation. I'm recording them in this office back here. That's right, and I will uh, do so. Don't be scared about it. It's just very simple. All you can have to say is, Richard, we love you. We're sending prayers for you, and we know you're going to be healed and blessed. That's all you have to do, And but it can make a big, huge difference for him. All right, those are all my uh, 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 announcements this morning, and so to get us started, let's have a reading and treatment. Who's our practitioner today? Pat, come on up, Pat. My reading this morning is a poem by Mary Oliver from her book, Why I Wake Early. Hello, sun in my face. Hello, you who make the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of tulips and the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety. Best preacher that ever was, Dear star, that just happens to be where you are in the universe. To keep us from ever darkness, to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the gray hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now how I start the day in happiness, in kindness. like to close your eyes and get comfortable. The power of the universe surrounds us. We are all individual manifestations of this fabulous power. It's so easy to take it in. It's so easy to be a part of the magnificence. God and I, God and you, are magnificent. And I am so grateful for all of the opportunities this provides me. I'm so grateful for everyone here today and for our beloved Reverend Ken, who gives us messages that stay with us for the whole week. I know that there is health surrounding us. I know that any who are having difficulty can be healed and find strength. I give thanks for this knowing as we send this message to the universe. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, Pat. Am I 
strong enough to bear the burdens that sometimes come living this thing called life and am I wise enough to make the right decisions when I'm standing at the fork in the road sometimes I wonder and ponder only to realize I'm not where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. I am the place where God shows up. I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. I am the place where God shows us. Will I have enough to do the things I need to do to take care of myself. Will I have the health of mind and body to live a life of grace and holiness? Sometimes I wonder and ponder only to realize I'm not I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. I am the place where God shows up. I am the place where God lives, moves and breathes and has its being. I am the place where God shows up. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. I think he's out at um, our large uh, uh, community out in Denver, the Church of Over a Thousand People. I think that's where that got recorded, Mal High. If you're ever out in Denver, be sure to go by and visit them. It's an amazing place. So this morning, I'm talking about new ideas, new ideas. I had a, a, a kind of a reminder this week of how necessary it is to keep your mind open to new ideas. And, you know, it can become challenging as we get older because we have a tendency to think we know everything. And it can be particularly challenging when there's no ideas or wisdom is coming from young people. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a difficult challenge to go from the, the person who's always giving advice to one that then have to accept advice. And uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, that we have to slink off and, and discount ourselves. We've gotten all this wisdom through our years, and, uh, but we should keep ourselves open for new ideas to come in, and hopefully to marry the, the, the old and the new. This is when really magic can happen, uh, is when we are willing to share our wisdom, but also be able to take in new, new wisdom. 
uh, not to over be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the ideas, not to ignore them, but to see if there's some way we can work with them. Because life's going to continue changing, uh, regardless of our fears or worries. So our why seems to me the wisest approach is to be open to the best, open to the best possibilities and, uh, and the easiest healings, because things are always changing. Not to get trapped in the idea that just because things have been that way, they will continue to be that way forever. And also getting caught in the idea that somehow back then there was a, the good old days, back then. No, I was back there. They weren't good old days, you know. No, now's, now's a better time. Now there's so much, so much easier now. Now's the day. And now's the day we have. This is the day we have to work with. So we want to keep ourselves open. Like I said, this notion of getting trapped in a, a way of thinking happened to me this week. I, on Monday, realized I had an eye infection. And uh, I had had this infection a long time ago when I was a young person in D.C. And I remember at that time, they basically told you to put warm compresses on your eye. And in two weeks to 14 days, it would be, it would be better. And then it likely would go on to the other eye, and with 10 days to two weeks, that eye would be better. So you could be, you, could be, you know, have this thing for, for three weeks. And so I went to the uh, med clinic. Uh, the young uh, physician assistant, he came in. I have socks older than this guy. Socks older than him. He, he came in, he looked at my eyes quickly, he said, you've got this, this infection. He says, take these drops, in 24 hours it'll clear up. He could have been talking Chinese to me for all I was understanding. I just could not comprehend what he was telling me. And I would say to him, well, what if it goes into the other eye? And he would say, I'm writing the prescription for you, use these drops, it will clear up in 24 hours. Then I asked him, well, how long will it be infectious? I'm writing a prescription for you. <laughs> Use the eye drops. Clear. I just couldn't take it in. I could not take in the good news. There was better news for me, a better idea. I was having, I couldn't fit it into my framework of how the world worked. And I was convinced, convinced he didn't know what he was talking about. It's not going to work in 24 hours. That's what I thought to myself. It's not going to work in 24 hours. Guess what? I was right. It didn't work in 24. It took 48. Because I gave the virus permission to stay around. I, I had bought extra room of the room for the virus. I bought room service for it. It didn't need to go anywhere. It was happy where it was at. I gave it permission to stick around. And that's what it did. That's what it did. My beliefs. My beliefs. Now, here's another story about beliefs of how your beliefs can, can change or uh, a healing, and speed of healing. Right when I got out of college, I made the big mistake. The summer I got out of college, I made the big mistake of moving back to Macon, Georgia. That was the last time I moved back there, let me tell you. And it was hot, humid, and miserable as summers in Macon, Georgia are. And in the middle of the summer, I came down with laryngitis. I could barely speak above a whisper. And for about two, two weeks, I uh, had to endure all of my mom's home remedies that she would pick up at the beauty shop. Every time she'd go to the beauty shop, she'd come back with some evil torture, you know, suck a lemon, uh, put Vicks Vapor Rub on the bottom of your feet when you went to sleep. You know, like, what is this? Finally, I went to the, the family doctor, and he gave me some pills or something. It didn't work. So then my mom had checked around and found there was an ear, nose, throat specialist in Macon. And she got me an appointment, and she did go to him. I should have known I was in the wrong direction going to a specialist in Macon. That should have tipped me off. But when I got to this guy, he was a middle-aged guy, and he was so full of himself. He was so full of himself. He came in with a nurse, and this was at the time before computers, uh, and the nurse that behind him was writing down everything he was saying. 
And he came in. He had little regard for me. I remember he grabbed my tongue with some gauze and practically snatched it out. And uh, he looked at it for a second, and he said, you've got a paralyzed larynx. He said, you will never talk again. You won't ever talk again. And he spun on his heels. He was headed out. And as he was headed out, I, I shouted a question at him. I said, but I want to be, at this time, I wanted to be a college professor. That's how I hoped my career would go. I would be a college professor. And that's what I asked him. I said, I want to be a college professor. What should I do? Without breaking his stride, he looked back over his shoulder and basically kind of shouted at me, learn sign language. Learn sign language. And off he, was, off he was. Well, that sent me into a tailspin of depression. And I stewed in my depression for a while. I finally had a friend who lived in Atlanta, and she actually had just had a little baby who had ear, nose, and throat problems. She had gone to this young doctor who had just graduated from Emory, and she said, Ken, come up and see him. He's just graduated. He's on the cutting edge of everything. You'll really like him. And I went up to have a, a, a visit with him. And I remember he came in, and one of the things, he sat down and he talked to me. And I told him, I said, this guy said, I'll never talk again. And he says, this, he says it doesn't make sense. He said, let me, let me see what's going on. And he had the cutting-edge technology. He had a little camera on a long tube. And so they went down, and he says, look, he says, you've got laryngitis. It's aggravated because you're living in Macon, Georgia, which pretty much aggravates everything. And, and he says, I, I've got, I, he says, I'm going to give you some allergy sprays and some other things. He says, you'll be talking. You'll be talking before I see you next time. And so he scheduled an appointment within two weeks. He sent me on my way. I get home. I get the prescriptions. Within 24 hours, I was talking again. 24 hours. I remember I had went and picked up one of my friends, and I just yelled out because I, you know, I was so happy to have my voice back. A lot of people around me weren't that happy, but I was happy I had my voice back. Two weeks later, I go to the doctor, and I'm telling him, I'm talking to him, so he says, well, I'm really happy. I told you you could get your voice get back. He said, how long did it take? And I said, well, it was less than 24 hours my voice was back. I could see the surprise on his face. He said, Ken, that medicine hadn't even had time to get into your system. It wasn't the medicine that cured me. It was his belief, that he, his affirmation, you'll be healed. That's what cured me. That's what broke through the negativity of the first doctor. That's what broke through the negativity that I had taken in. It was a better and new idea. And that's what we're challenged to do, is to take them in where they are around us, to stay open to new ideas coming in, to take the information in, work with it as best we can, and then create a better solution when we can to be in the mix of all of it, not to check out, not to go slink off in the corner, but be in the mix of all of it. You know, we're getting our website updated uh, because we want to take advantage of a Google grant. Google has given us this grant that will give us $1,000 of free advertisement, and so we're wanting to do that. And it means that I'm having to interact with some very brilliant young people. These are people who have just graduated from the best colleges because they're working with Google. They're very intelligent people. And they're throwing out ideas, and some of the ideas are really good. But one of the ideas I was having, kind of having a problem with because they want to take the top searches that young people are making on the Internet for religious communities, and they're wanting to somehow incorporate them into our website. So their idea was to write articles and to post them as my uh, blog for me. And that was a good idea, but I was worried because the articles didn't sound like me. And I kept asking them, well, if somebody reads the article and then they come hear me, they're going to be disappointed because <laughs> I don't sound anything like the articles. I'm nowhere near that intelligent. So we, we, we worked around. We got, we got a solution. What we did is we put the articles in another place. But here's the thing. 
Here's the thing. I was reading over the articles, and most of them were, were stuff that I, I knew about. But there was one that had a topic that I knew nothing about. I have not heard this anywhere, but evidently it's a very hot topic right now for young people. And that is deconstructionism. Deconstructionism. And the thing is, is that for kids who've been raised in fundamentalist households, like I was, that you get to a point where you look back and you decide, is this working for me or not? It's a re-examining of their faith, but they're calling it a deconstruction of their faith. And it's a very healing thing, and it, it's something that we've promoted for, forever. The voyage of faith is a deeply intimate and transformative one, and there are moments when you have certainty, and then you have doubt, you have ex exploration, and then introspection. When I was looking for a, a teaching, when my friends began to die of AIDS when I was in D.C., all of a sudden I had people just dropping the faith. I went, and I, I went from east of weird to west of orthodox looking for a, a, you know, a, a place. And so I, I searched far and wide. And this is what we, we're called to do. And a pathway, a, mil, a stepping stone on this journey is when you start questioning the ideas that you got as a child, when you start questioning, is this working for me? I love in Judaism, they talk about that Judaism is really a wrestling with God, that you, don't, you do not accept the ideas you've been given uh, just, just blankly, that you question them, you debate them, you, you study scholars. You know, uh, when they have a Seder service in uh, Judaism, they will tell the young people, the only bad thing you can do here is not ask a question if you have one. They want the kids questioning faith. They want the kids because the more we question, the deeper our, 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 our faith can become. Not questioning our faith isn't going to lead to a deeper faith. It just keeps things bottled up. And in our teaching, we encourage everyone to have a God of their understanding. One that does not scare you and one that does not insult you. You can leave that part to your family, but don't give it over to God. You don't want a God that scares you or a God that uh, insults you. You want a God of your understanding. And this is closely tied to the recovery movement. And many of the ideas that came up through the recovery movement, we adopted because we, we were kind of step kids to the recovery movement. Lots of ideas we share with them. And this idea of deconstructionism to me sounds very similar to a fearless inventory that's so important in recovery examining your ideas, to look over your convictions and ask yourself, is this serving me? Is this helping me live a greater, more fulfilling life? Is this helping me be a more loving person, kind and compassionate? You know, one of the things that happened to me, I, I told you this, I was being raised and trained to be a Baptist, uh, or not even a Baptist minister, a Church of God minister, a fundamentalist minister. But very early on, I began to reject what they were telling me. And the reasons were because it did not seem that these ideas were helping them live better lives. They weren't, they didn't seem to have, a, 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 they were very fearful and they were angry. And so it caused me to think that there's got to be something better out there somewhere. It was a long journey. The sense of questioning. It can, it, it can bubble up unease, but it's a, per, it's a stepping stone to personal growth and transformation. The questions prompt us to challenge our assumptions, and confront our biases, and shed light on the blind spots, urging us to delve deeper into our truths. And I think that's what a lot of scares a lot of people. I think many of us have this idea that if we really reveal the truth about ourselves, the stone-cold truth about ourselves, that we would not be loved by God. And that is a lie. That's a lie that has been pushed by people who want to control you, want your money, 
want to uh, keep you under a system. What that within you is perfection. And nothing in the world can turn it off. Gardner Holmes says, he says, the intellect and the subconscious self, uh, those are the parts of us that need renewing. The spirit neither sleeps nor slumbers. And any amount of adjustments within ourselves is because uh, can be healed when we recognize this perfection within us. Now, I know you can say to yourself, well, there are times I don't feel very perfect perfect. My life doesn't seem perfect. What I see out in the world doesn't seem perfect. But this teaching will tell you you can look at a situation square in the face and know the truth. And the truth is that within your heart and soul, there is a, 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 a light, an example. There is a spark of the divine. And you can never distinguish, put that spark out. You can dim it down or you can allow it to grow and glow and illuminate the world. This is what Christ said in the Gospel Gospels. He said, we have a spark of the divine within us. And he says, if you will let it grow, it will illuminate the world. He says, if you keep it small, it will consume your soul. So we are here to illuminate the world. We are here to look out in the world and see all the confusion, see all the distrust, see all the anger out there and say, this is not the truth for me. The truth for me is I am a child of God. I've come life to experience the great goodness of spirit. I'm here to live in love and joy. I'm here to be awed, awed with how much spirit supports me. This is what we've come to do, and we can do it. It's within every one of us, and Spirit has faith in you. You are beloved by God, and you've never disappointed Spirit for one moment. We've made mistakes along the way. We're human. You can't go through this experience and not make mistakes. But Spirit is not counting up those mistakes so it can judge you. It's not worried about your mistakes. It is in all of your possibilities, your possibilities to bring more love to life, bring more health and compassion and kindness to life. We are here to create a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem in this time and in this moment. It is within every one of us to do, and we're up to the task. This is the truth in your life this morning. It's the truth in mine, and so it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. spelling G-O-D same word backwards D-O-G they would stay with me all day I'm the one who walks away but both of them just wait for me and dance at my return with glee both love me no matter what, divine God and canine mutt. I take it hard each time I fail, but God forgives, dog wags his tail. God thought up and made the dog, dog reflects a part of I've seen love from both sides now, it's everywhere, amen, bow wow. I look up and I see God, I look down and see my dog, and in my human frailty, I can't match their love.
So now we come to the time we support our center, and we support this wonderful place because this is a bright light of hope and love and illumination, and we're making a difference. If it's giving computers to the Betty Griffith Center, if it's sending food off to the food pantry, if it's making scholarships to the uh, Venus Manley Scholarship Program, we're making the world a better place for our having been in it, and that's all we're ever counted as to do. So if you will, uh, uh, there are ways you can support us. You can do that through volunteership. You can do it through consciousness and prayers, just seeing us growing and thriving. Of course, you can do it financially. However you choose to do it, know that we're very grateful for it. And if you will take your intention and place it over your heart and read with us our affirmation of prosperity. I live in a universe of abundance as I freely and joyfully give. I join in the divine flow and all I share with life returns to me multiplied abundantly, and so it is. If the ushers have stepped down, David, I think you got something for us. Day by day, day by day, oh dear Lord, the things I pray. <laughs> thank you, Karen, and thank you guys for supporting our center. We are a beacon of hope and love and light and inspiration, and you're doing your part to make sure that that beacon stays strong, sending healing compassion out to a world in need. So we thank you, we bless it, we release it, knowing it does its good and powerful work and returns to us multiplied abundantly. And together we say, and so it is. All right, so let's conclude our, our service with an affirmative prayer. Uh, take it in for yourself. I'm going to do it in the first person. If I say something that works for you, hold tight to that. If I say something that doesn't work for you, just let that part slide by. But just know this truth with me today. There is but one God and one mind and one power, 
And day by day, I open my eyes to this power. Day by day, I lift my eyes up to see this energy, this love flowing into my life with new ideas and new possibilities. So here now, in this sacred place filled with all these wonderful, loving people, I now choose to have a better idea for myself, that I'm not weak and wounded, but I'm strong, I'm victorious, I'm courageous, and that I can move out into the world, making a big difference in the world through my love and compassion. So this weekend and this week coming up, as I hear the fireworks, I see them going off, I'm going to say to myself, this is the Spirit of God announcing the goodness showing up in my life and all the colors I see in the night sky, I'm going to say to myself, this is the multitude of blessings raining down upon me. As I'm moving out and I see the wonderful crepe myrtles blooming with all those wonderful colors, I'm going to remind myself, this is the blessing of God made manifest. I am here to be awed, awed with how much spirit loves me. I'm not here to be weak and wounded. I'm here to raise a flag of triumph a triumph over disease, of poverty, of lack and limitation, of uh, triumph over unworthiness. I am here to live as Spirit has called me to live, courageous and dynamic, moving out in the world, making the world a better place for my having been in it. It's what I've come to do, and I'm not turning back. I've lifted my eyes up, and I see the new heaven, a new Jerusalem, and I'm on the march. This is my truth. Every cell of my being radiates this right knowing, and I release this prayer into the mind of God to do its good and perfect, bold and dynamic work, returning to me multiplied abundantly. And together we say, and so it is. Oh, you're welcome. How you doing? Good to see you. Glad you're here. You doing good? How's mom? <laughs> 